so our, our design for this symposium was uh, sort of really mixing that, that um, leadership experience with these really fantastic young faculty who are driving the research in these areas. We were very fortunate to have uh, John here from Stanford. He's, uh, he's an assistant professor in both statistics and electrical engineering with a complimentary appointment in computer science. He's going to take us in yet a little bit different direction. And uh, so with that, I'll turn it over. Help me welcome John uh, to the podium. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, some different ideas in terms of understanding optimality and optimal estimators in, uh, in what I'll call locally private estimation and learning. Uh, let me give some examples of privacy breaches to give you kind of a, a sense that we might have problems and want to address them. So example one is microarrays. Micro so in microarray data, we, have, uh, we can collect a bunch of uh, gene expression levels across, say, chromosomes here. And uh, you know, lots of times when we do studies, we want to release microarray data. And you might think, OK, if you have a bunch of people in a study and you release the sort of counts of you know, all, of, all of their counts pooled together, things should be fine. OK, let's, let's, uh, let's do a little quick example. So here's, you know, here's some fake data set, right? So here's gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, gene 4. And this is how many people in your study had gene one turned on, et cetera. Okay, and now we might ask, okay, so somebody else comes to you, he's applying for insurance or something like this, and uh, you wanna figure out, well, okay, was he in this study of people who had, say, ovarian cancer? Well, okay, he wouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> was his mother or something like that? I don't know. This, uh, this example is getting away from me a little bit, but let's, let's roll with it. And uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, so, so we want to ask, was a person in this study? Okay, so this person, you know, here's, here's his or her, you know, genes that are on, and, and maybe, you know, the genes that are on were fairly common in the study, so maybe they were in there, okay? Now here's another person, and uh, if you look at this person, then there's all these places where there's only one person in the study who had that gene on, and this person has a gene everywhere there. And now this last person definitely was not in the study, because this gene isn't even expressed, right? So, so, and everybody in the study had this gene turned on. So you can kind of actually back out people who belong to studies just from these sort of, you know, summed aggregated counts, which is a little disturbing. And actually this was a paper by Nils Homer and some colleagues, and it caused the NIH to stop releasing genetic data, that's the National Institutes of Health, for a couple months, around 2008. Okay, that's kind of a problem, right? We might want access to some genetic data to do things. Okay, here's another example. So the Netflix prize. Uh, the Netflix Prize was this big competition that Netflix, the movie company, ran. They said, we'll give you a million dollars if you can improve our video recommendation system. Okay? It was the free, cheapest engineering they ever did, because they got hundreds of people to do this. So then they ran the competition, people made it a little better, then they said, okay, we're going to run another one, we're, gonna, we're going to release a little bit of extra data. Okay? Uh, and then this woman uh, claimed that because Netflix released that she had watched Brokeback Mountain, now she was outed to her family as a lesbian and she sued them, okay? And uh, I mean, I went to see Brokeback Mountain with a really good buddy of mine and weirdly, I actually had a rainbow jacket I was wearing when I went there. I just own it independently, but uh, I thought it was a great movie. But anyway, so that was the end of that and then it was canceled, okay? So, so these, have these, these kind of privacy breaches, sort of they're, they're kind of funny, but they have major implications in our lives, right? They cause real changes in the things that we do. Uh, okay, so, so, so then, you know, digging into this a little bit more deeply, you might ask, okay, so why do we want privacy when we do things? And, and other speakers have addressed this, you know, intrinsic, extrinsic motivations. Uh, well, you know, why do we want privacy? Well, maybe I don't want to share my genomic data with people. You know, maybe I use drugs, and I don't want you guys to know which drugs I use, okay? Uh, I can tell you the answer to that right now. It's caffeine and alcohol. Uh, <laughs> now you know all the drugs I use. Uh, one in the morning and one at night, but I won't tell you which. <laughs> gotta, gotta, bid, gotta get out of bed somehow. Uh, so, you know, maybe my financial information. But there are lots of potential benefits to getting access to data like this, which uh, I'm forgetting the provost's name now, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Provost Miranda talked to us about them. You know, you saw them and they were amazing, right? We can get better understanding of biological bases of disease, better epidemiological control, like where is lead in this town, uh, better economic policy making, right? But there are some consequences, you know, if we're going to impose privacy questions, right? I mean, I mean you can ask, like, so, so this is a, a quote from this task force on differential privacy for census data out of a demography group at the University of Minnesota. They are not super keen on what Simpson is going to talk about, I imagine. Uh, but so they're really worried about, you know, by imposing unrealistic privacy standards, the census is basically just uh, tanking a lot of the data, or they think they're tanking a lot of the data that they use. And we'll get into this more later. I'm not advocating or not advocating this. I'm just saying, you know, there are a lot of questions here, okay? So to me, you know, so, so I'm a statistician and an engineer. So what I want to try to understand are what are the fundamental trade-offs between privacy or some way we can formalize privacy and uh, statistical utility, whereby for me, uh, statistical utility just means you know, something like accuracy of estimators, okay? So how well can I estimate different quantities that I'm curious about? And so can we nail down what these are? Okay, so, so to do this, uh, we're gonna need to both define what privacy means and what utility means. So, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time doing that in this talk, and then I'm gonna give you a couple of different examples and a couple of results that we've been thinking of and developing in my group and in collaboration with people at some of the major uh, tech companies like Apple, Google, these places. Okay. So how do we formulate privacy? So, so the, the sort of typical formulation, uh, or at least the, a very frequently used one, is that there's data coming in, and through this talk, I'm gonna represent this as x1, x2, through xn, and so each x here is, so, say, the data of an individual, so x1 is my data, x2 is Kathy's data, x3 is Rudy's, et cetera, okay? And then it goes into some mechanism or scheme or data analysis or whatever you want to call it and out pops some analysis or some statistics or something like this. And then usually this is some kind of trusted curator and we sort of trust them to keep our things safe, you know, because they're our doctor or whatever. All right, I'm going to actually work in a slightly different model where you don't trust the people collecting your data because as we saw earlier, they're in the Silicon Valley next to my university. Uh, and, and no one trusts us. They do trust the NSA, but they don't trust us. Okay, or, or ever, that's what I'm taking home from today. Uh, <laughs> I'm learning a lot here, uh, so I hope you are too. So, so, so in, in local privacy, uh, data providers don't trust the collectors of the data. And this is actually an old idea that goes back to work in the 60s on survey sampling, you know, going door to door, asking people for information about their habits. And so the game is the following. Right, so I've got my people, x1, x2, through xn, but then before the data goes in to try to compute some estimator or some quantity, I'll just call this theta hat for now, this is my like algorithm or statistics box, uh, it turns into some z1 through zn where these are private. Okay, so these are some kind of obfuscated version of the original data. And so there's some barrier between me and whatever you, the statistician or machine learner or company or whatever, get to see. Okay, and so, and uh, the way I'll think about this, uh, because I'm an electrical engineer some days, what we do is we call this a channel, uh, or a noisy channel. Uh, we just, you know, it's gonna go, we have X, it goes through some, whoopsie, goes through some distribution Q and out pops Z. Okay, all right, so, so we have individuals, they have private data XI from some population, and then we have some estimator that's a function of their privatized data, okay. All right, I'm not gonna worry about that. So, so a, a, a different way to look at this is, you know, so, so the typical model would be I have my personal data. No, we'll have your personal data. There's me, the statistician or poli policymaker or person in Silicon Valley um, creeping on your data. And uh, before it gets to me, it gets obfuscated and we're gonna guarantee that, you know, the probability that say, I can distinguish, say, Kathy from Rudy, given this sort of private z, whatever it is, is gonna be less than say like a half plus some small epsilon. So nearly 50-50, not much better than 50-50 guess whether it's Kathy's data or Rudy's data. So that's the game, that's how we set up the game of privacy. Just make sure we have 50, not much better than 50-50 chance even if I get to observe whatever the heck you spit out from z. All right, okay, so, so why, would we, my, why might we want this? Well, so most of you probably have one of these in your pocket, right? Um, you know, maybe an Android, maybe, uh, or maybe you have one of these. 
No, no one has these anymore. My kids are going to get one of these when they turn, you know, 18 or something. Uh, not, nothing before then. Uh, yeah, right. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. They don't argue much. Uh, but anyway, so, so, you know, so, so, so Apple or Google or whomever, you know, they want to do some kind of machine learning. You know, they're going to, you've got data on your phone. They want it. They want to be able to, I don't know, provide you better services, sell you something, things like this. You know, maybe, uh, so here's a bunch of Android phones, I guess. Uh, so you want to have something like an image classifier, right, or some kind of text translation scheme on your phone. Or, you know, Google has this thing now where you take pictures of things and it tells you what they are. It's like, that's a chair. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Right? And so, but, but you think it's kind of cool, and so you, you want to you be able to get this. But you know, for pretty re good reasons, maybe you don't trust you know, whoever is getting the data downstream from your phone, so you want to guarantee that it's private before it leaves your phone. Okay? Or at least you, know, you want uh, Dan to tell you that, yeah, I checked out the code, and whatever Apple and Google are actually running, it really is privatizing your data. Okay? Yeah, then he's happy. Right? Okay. Um, so, 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 so the, the picture somehow is, is that you have something like this. You know? so, so, you know, let's say this is uh, Google or Apple or not Facebook because they just collect everything. And, uh, oh, I forgot this was on video. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so, you know, so, so they are, they'll like send you some kind of uh, model that they think of the world. You might send some update to say, oh no, your model isn't working for me. Here's how it should get fixed. I mean, the phone will do this. And you repeat this back and forth and back and forth. And so the game is that we're going to make sure that these kind of updates to this sort of centrally curated statistics or machine learned model or whatever are going to be private. Okay, so uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to ask for some audience participation right now. Ask me the most provocative question you can. Yes, no question that you think I'd be really uncomfortable answering. Why did I give up my rainbow jacket? That's not a yes or no question. Give me a yes or no question. Did, you give up your did I give up my rainbow jacket? OK. That's not that provocative. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this coin, right? And I'm going to flip it twice. OK? And if it's heads twice in a row, I'm going to lie to you. And if it's not heads twice in a row, I'm going to tell you the truth. So, so I'm going to say yes if I did give up my rainbow jacket, or no, I still have my rainbow jacket. OK? So I'm going to lie if it's heads twice. So that's one flip. OK? That's two flips. All right, I still have my rainbow jacket. OK? You guys don't know, right? Uh, so so, uh, but so that, that mechanism right there, it turns out that's called randomized response. And we can prove that if I want to estimate something like the proportion of people who have rainbow jackets in this room, uh, that is an optimal way to do it, OK, under our sort of mechanism or our, our constraint that I can't tell whether the data was from you or from me. Right? So, so one, of the, one of the results we have is that that kind of thing is optimal. I actually had a, a particular provocative question, which was, have I smoked marijuana? Uh, this is getting less and less provocative. Where I live, this is not provocative at all, because it's like, <laughs> you're in California, bro. Like, OK, so we'll go on from there. OK, um, I'm sure not answering that. Uh, all right, so um, OK. So, so to, to make this a little tiny bit more formal, uh, what we do, the way we mathematize what I'm doing, is we say a channel, this, this is this way I privatize your data x, and it becomes whatever this obfuscated thing z is, is we say it's differentially private if the probability that I observe something, that's, that's the probability that z belongs to some set a, say the probability that z is 1, given that the data is mine, divided by the probability that the data z is 1, given that the data was Rudy's, uh, this ratio is sort of close to 1. Okay? So this epsilon parameter floating around governs you know, how much data you get to collect about people. And it, and it turns out that this is intimately connected with what's the probability I can tell whether the data was yours or mine. Okay? Well, it's exact value, not super important. But roughly, the privacy po folks will tell you that we should expect epsilon to be like 1, or maybe a little less. Okay? So, that's the game. OK, so now the, the OK, so now uh, I don't care about that. OK, so let me give you a vignette, all right? So let's suppose I'm at one of these universities. OK, so actually, uh, this, I have real data for this. And this real data is literally from one of these universities that publishes all the salaries of everyone at the university. So it's not really private data. But uh, let's pretend it were, OK? Uh, but I want to estimate the median salary of everybody working, say, at the University of California system. 
Okay? So how might you do that? How could you estimate the median salary? But make sure that individual's data is kept private. Okay, because I don't want to compromise anybody's salary, even though the state of California mandates that it be published on the web. Okay, well, so, so the first thing you might do, say, okay, uh, I'm going to just take everybody's salary, and I'm going to add a bunch of noise to it, and then I'm going to take the median of that resulting thing. All right, well, that seems reasonable. Like, okay, you know, my salary is whatever, you know, $100,000. I'm going to add a bunch of noise to that $100,000, and then I'll let you see, you know, $100,000 plus or minus a whole bunch of noise. Okay, and then I don't care. That's a fine idea. It turns out it's a terrible idea. That won't work at all. Okay, you're never gonna get the right, the right answer with that. So here's a much better idea. I'm actually gonna go around to everybody in this room and I'm gonna ask, hey, here's my current guess of the median salary in this room. Is your salary higher or is your salary lower? And then I'll let you flip my coin a couple times and you'll either tell me the truth or you'll tell me, to, tell me a lie. I won't know which because you flipped the coin. And then we'll just keep doing this, okay? And then every time somebody tells me, okay, my salary is higher, I'll increment my guess at the salary. Every time somebody tells me my salary is lower, I'm gonna lower my guess at the salary. We're just gonna repeat this. Okay, and it turns out if you do this, here's what you see. All right, so this green line up top is uh, what happens if you just add noise to everybody's salaries and take the medians. All right, so I just added a whole boatload of noise to everybody's and I took the medians. And I actually had 250,000 people in this sample. So I have an error of about oh, $1,000, and this gets to observe everybody's salary with some noise. Okay, now if we do my little strategy of wandering around asking people, hey, do you make more or less than this, but I'll let you lie to me. Well, after seeing about, say, 50,000 people, so that's one-fifth of the total sample, my error, and I did this experiment a bunch of times, my error is about $2. Okay, so $2 error versus $1,000 error. And then if we actually get to everybody, our error is, oh, I don't know, about 60 cents, okay? So that's a thousand-fold improvement in terms of our error, right? And how did we get that? Well, we got that by asking, okay, how do I, you know, how do I understand this problem? Give me a lower bound, say, a fundamental limit that says you can't estimate this any better than this, and then let's find an algorithm that actually hits that, that actually achieves that. That's how we do this, is we want to prove fundamental limits and then achieve them, okay? So this is why it's important, because, you know, thousand-fold improvement, that's a big improvement. That's, uh, I mean, okay, who cares? It's like the, S, the median salary at the Berkeley School, at UC Berkeley is $20,000 or something, but whatever. That's because it's all graduate students. They don't make anything. Uh, I was one of those. Okay, so, so, so then, you know, now, now I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time just kind of going off the deep end, because this is what I like to do. I noodle around and prove things now and then, and then I uh, go and talk to companies and get them to stick them in your phones and stuff like this. Okay, so, so how do we talk about optimality? Well, uh, so we said we're gonna talk about what are the trade-offs between privacy and estimation. What I mean is how does risk, in this case, risk means, just means expected error. How does expected error scale with the sample size, the number of people we're collecting data from? And uh, yeah, that's, there, there's some kind of uh, non-trivial ways we do this. But basically what we ask is, here's, here's some complicated formulas. So, so there might be a few of you in the audience who look at this and say, yeah, that makes sense, which better to Rudy. He's, a, he's the chair of the statistics department. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so what's the game? Basically we just ask, okay, I have some collection of populations that might exist in the world. I wanna make sure that whatever estimator I have is gonna work for whatever population I happen to be sampling from. That's all I care about. Because whatever that, because I don't know what the population is ahead of time, I just want to make sure it's going to work for all of them. Okay? And then under that constraint of it working for all, good, all the populations I might be sampling from, let's just find the best possible sort of way to privatize data and the best estimator. So that's how we're going to define optimality, okay? That's, that's it. So it's got to work for all the populations I might see, and then we just ask, what's the best possible estimator subject to the constraint that it always works? That's the game, okay? And uh, when we do that, it turns out what you see, since I've only got five minutes left, I can kind of skip a few of these, is roughly, here, here's, let's just do one, let me go through one example with some formulas real quick, okay? So let's say I'm gonna get data from a normal distribution, that's a bell curve, okay? Just, I'm getting data and it's shaped like a bell curve, so my population has some kind of bell curve shaped distribution. And, uh, 
let's say I'm, gonna, I'm not going to only ask about sort of one attribute of you. I'm going to ask about your salary. I'm going to ask about your height. I'm going to ask about how many fingers you have and uh, how many square feet your house is. Okay, so I care about four things about you. So I'm going to ask for a four-dimensional quantity. Or we might, in general, just ask for a d-dimensional quantity. Right, then if I just did this for everybody in the room, I took your sample mean and asked, okay, what's my error? The way that's going to scale is it's going to scale roughly as d, that's the dimension or the number of attributes I care about estimating, divided by n, that's the sample size, however many people I, I got samples from. As soon as I am forced to do this with privacy, say I want to actually guarantee you guys privacy, well then this goes from this dimension divided by sample size to the dimension divided by your privacy parameter, or your privacy parameter squared, depending on which one is smaller, times the original thing. Okay, so we went from d on n to another penalty, which is dimension dependent. So the more attributes I want to ask for, like the faster my sample size has to grow to get a good estimator. Okay, so this, this can kind of take us from saying, you know, say I want to ask you about, say, like 100 attributes, which isn't totally unreasonable. People collect a lot of data about you online. Right, 100 attributes is not unreasonable. This says I need a 100-fold increase in the data I collect to actually get anything accurate if I'm going to provide you privacy. Right? Which, well, what that might suggest is maybe we need to rethink about how we can do privacy and things like this, which is something we are actively working on. So, um, you know, then I've been doing, I've actually been doing some work with different uh, Bay Area, large Bay Area companies that sell phones. Um, They are located in the Bay Area. <laughs> they are busy fighting off the NSA. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so I'm not going to get into too much depth here. But <laughs> roughly, what we are trying to do is try to reconceptualize sort of how we might provide privacy. So, so one idea is that, you know, if, like, say I'm trying to privatize images, you know, and you just want to make sure that I can't reconstruct the, whatever photo you take from your phone. So, I probably don't need to add that much noise to keep you from doing that. Because here's literally, whoopsie, here are literally six random images from the web. If I just told you, hey, I'm going to hand you a random image, what is it? Like, draw me a picture of it. You probably wouldn't do a very good job, right? I mean, it's literally a random image. This is, you know, this is, I, I literally typed, there's a random image search function on the web. I typed, give me random image six times, and boom, this is the six, okay? Uh, so, so anyway, so, so you can actually do a lot more by allowing some relaxations of these things. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I, I think I have one minute left, so let's not talk about it too much. But roughly, let me just very briefly tell you one experimental result. Uh, here's a funny experiment. Let's say I want to, I'm, I'm collecting data. It's just handwritten digits. I want to predict whether a handwritten digit is a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, et cetera. Okay, and I'm going to ask, Okay, I'm gonna, I, I, we can actually develop optimal solution schemes for doing this under our different privacy constraints. And uh, this is just a plot. So, so th this axis right here is our test accuracy. So we can actually get to near 100% test accuracy. This blue line is what happens if you send things without any privacy at all. And then if we're a little bit careful with some of our optimal procedures, if you want standard privacy guarantees, it turns out that your accuracy is right around 10%. I didn't even include that plot because it doesn't change. No matter how much data we get, you get 10% accuracy, which is to say 1 out of 10, which is to say you are guessing at random. Okay, so, so not great. But if you relax some of these definitions in ways we've been playing with, you can actually get closer and closer to clear performance while still providing some privacy guarantees, which I haven't told you what they are, but just, you know, these are, these are things we are still actively working on because we're trying to understand how can we fundamentally trade off when do we say, hey, we've lost too much utility to actually provide privacy for this application? That's what is the, to me, that's what's the fundamental question here. All right, so um, anyway, thanks a bunch for your attention. Uh, I think that, you know, there, th 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 these questions of fundamental limits, really understanding, like, both from a mathematical and applied perspective, what is the best we could possibly do here are super important. Uh, and it turns out for a lot of cases, we're actually going to need to relax some of our stringent privacy definitions that we've been proposing in literature to make them practical. Here are some references if you're super curious, uh, and I'm happy to take more questions. So I will ask one really uh, quickly. So as there's so much public data, 
is there any sense of even adding privacy to that public data or should it just, we just expect that everything is gonna be known? <laughs> mm, yeah, that's like, here, let me, let me see. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a good question. So, so this is something I, I think about a lot. Like, you know, I do this research on privacy, right? And I say, okay, here's a way to get privacy or maintain privacy. But maybe that ship has sailed and, uh, you know, Google knows all your data already and Facebook knows all your data already and maybe the, the actual right answer is that everything should just be public because then nobody can exploit it. Uh, Yeah, but if it's not, say, say, so, so let's, I mean, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm saying something provocative on purpose, a little bit, uh, well, clearly on purpose, but, um, you know, so, so let's say that a few corporations know all your private data, right, and you kind of think, okay, well, I don't want that to be public, but now they have a lot of control over you, you know, they could maybe blackmail you or threaten you with making something public. If all your data is public, it does, you know, obviate that risk. Okay, so, so I think, I think it's, a, it's a legit question that we should be asking ourselves. Like, do we want only, you know, the big tech companies and the NSA to know all of our private data? <laughs> you know, the punching bag sit over We're in not that comfortable corner. with the NSA. <laughs> no, we're comfortable with the NSA. We're happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're comfortable with the NSA. We're happy with that one. Um, you know, but so, 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 so the question is, where do we want to set this? this privacy boundary, and, 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 and it's possible that the cat's not totally out of the bag yet. You know, some, some corporations say, okay, well, we really wanna maintain privacy, so we're gonna be really, really serious about it. Some corporations maybe don't, uh, but it's a, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer yet, yeah. I think the, the major, I mean, we've got a long discussion about this, I'm sure, but I think that the major problem with that is that some secrets are more dangerous than others. Right. You know, that people get attacked for their secrets, and even killed for their secrets, you know, for their private data. You know, you don't fit in this community that you live in because of some quirk of yours. Mm -hmm. You know, people will come with the pitchforks and the torch. Yeah. Yeah. Human nature is still human nature. Yeah. It's a. It's a. I think it's a big question. We need to think about it. And I don't. I don't have perfect answers. Yeah. Right. So uh, let's uh, thank Dr. Ducci for his excellent talk. <laughs>